the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. The United States goes through periodic crises, but the next 10 years are going to be very difficult for the United States internally and therefore externally as well. So we really have to watch over the next 10 years. You have to keep watching the scared countries, China and Russia, and watch how they behave. Because being weak doesn't mean you can't hit hard. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. I always look forward to the interview with Dr. George Friedman. I look forward to every book that he publishes. And what's interesting to me is any book that I've read of his, he seems to talk about things that as I watch the news five, six, seven years later, it's like, wow, he called that a little bit like calling a move on a chessboard during a championship game. Lou Dobbs says he's one of the country's leading strategic affairs experts. Um, it reminds me of dinner table conversations we would have growing up where my dad loved talking about geopolitics and things that we would talk about casually at dinner all of a sudden would be in the news five to six years later. And so there is, a, for me, almost a bit of nostalgia in talking with George. It sometimes feels like I'm visiting with my dad again. Well, strangely, it's been a couple of years, and I know you'd like to check in every year, but I know every few years we try to get with George Friedman. Every few years we do check in with George Friedman for his views on geopolitical events and their significance, and we've learned a lot from his approach to international relations and, of course, from the insights that he's explored both in writing and as he's shared them on our program. I love reading through uh, The Next Hundred Years, which he wrote a few years back, and The Next Decade. Flashpoints. I mean, there's actually a number of books that uh, George has written, which have been influential in, in my thinking, very helpful in clarifying sort of who's who and who's doing what in the world. And I strongly encourage the curious among you to check out his articles and timely offerings at geopoliticalfutures.com. Uh, geopoliticalfutures.com is a, is a great resource and to subscribe there and have uh, daily inputs, uh, you'll find that you have, compared to just your regular news outlets, uh, really some intriguing insights, whether it's Brexit, uh, things relating to uh, geopolitics in, in the Middle East or in Asia. It's uh, information that I, I simply won't do without. So context is critical to understanding, and of course, depth of understanding is critical to improved planning and, and strategic implementation. So although we're a financial company, we're always interested in a multidisciplinary approach to understanding. And George brings many of his insights into that. Our conversations with you, George, have spanned now over a decade, and they've, they've always been uh, refreshingly insightful. So let's dive in. There are three areas I'd like to cover and I'll pose some specific questions for each of these, but as kind of a preview, not in particularly any order of priority, I want to talk with you today about um, you know, the Pacific Rim, thinking specifically of China's changing economic stature in recent decades and their uh, more recent geographical extensions. There's a lot there. We could talk about whether it's Hong Kong, issues relating to Taiwan, uh, issues relating to the Paracel and Spratly Islands. Uh, so that's number one. We'll, we'll come back around to that. Number two is the Middle East. We know from past conversations that the balance of power disturbed through the elimination of Saddam Hussein has brought Iran and Turkey and even other non-state actors into action uh, in very significant ways with either dreams of a caliphate or a resurgence of an older empire. And so I'd love to explore that with you today as well, looking at Iran and Turkey and some current events in the light of history. And then last but not least is Europe. Uh, of course, Russia factors into the Iranian and Turkey uh, relations significantly. But I also want to see what your thoughts are on Russia's strategic shifts as they relate to Europe, NATO in general, and specifically with Poland, Ukraine and Belarus. So I guess before we dive into those areas, are any initial comments you'd like to open with uh, or a way of sort of framing our conversation today? Well, first, thanks for having me. I always enjoy being here. And it's interesting to match geopolitics and financial markets. The financial markets are affected by it. They in turn affect the geopolitical balance. So from our point of view, there's just one. They're the same thing, different aspects of the same thing. 
for different ways. I think uh, the point that I would really emphasize is that, look, we are still in the grips of 2008. 2008 changed the way the world worked. It put a premium on importers. They were more stronger than the exporters had been. It changed the dynamics of national power. And we still haven't worked out all the things that uh, emerged there. We'll get to talk about it, I hope. But I think we all have to understand that 2008 ended the post-World War II world. It undermined the principle of independence. It made it much more difficult to build the kind of international structures like the EU, and it really created new coalitions. So we're at 2008, and we're trying to work it out. I wanted to begin with uh, the Middle East. You were recently in Istanbul, and Recep Tayyip Erdogan gave the keynote immediately following your speech. And maybe from a high level, you can describe sort of the Turkish interlude in recent decades, um, referencing sort of the Ottoman Empire that's come before it, and what you see emerging or reemerging in future decades. So maybe juxtaposing the 30,000-foot view with the ways that Turkey is reasserting itself in the present in the region, Libya comes to mind as a particular interesting aspect. Well, for the past thousand years, Asia Minor, Turkey, has always been the home of a critical empire, be it the Byzantine Empire, uh, the Ottoman Empire, or whatnot. The last hundred years have been freakish because the Ottomans collapsed and no great power replaced it. Uh, what Erdogan did was say, with the rise of radical Islam affecting uh, Turkey, it could no longer be simply a secular country. It had to make its peace. Other parties didn't want to do that. He did it. It was a unpleasant process to watch it happening, but he's now the head of the United Turkey. And it was a funny thing that I, I had written in the next hundred years that Turkey would emerge a great regional power. And at my speech, which was on the anniversary of the publication of my book, I said, and now is the time when Turkey will start reaching out, perhaps first to the Eastern Mediterranean and North Africa. And this was three days before Turkey reached out into uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. But I had been with President Erdogan and we talked a little bit. He actually does English fairly well. And, uh, you know, he made not a mention of the fact that he'd already intended to do what I had said theoretically was going to happen. What has happened is that Turkey has asserted itself. It's asserted itself in the regions it was always powerful. It's just made a very large loan to Bosnia and the Balkans. It has entered the Mediterranean. It has entered North Africa. It is fishing around in Somalia and other African countries. Turkey is historically the home of a great regional power, uh, sometimes an empire. And that's what we're seeing uh, emerge. And it's not always visible what's going on. But as with my speech and my mention of the Eastern Mediterranean and a complete poker face on Erdogan as we talked, they plan ahead and they are planning big things. Well, clearly to literally fuel their endeavors and ambitions, a Turkish interests uh, have to locate a reliable source of oil. And it seems that Libya is a go-to in that respect. Maybe you could explore with us what that means for other interested parties in Libya. Russia, not too keen on the move that uh, Turkey's making right now. Um, t tell us a little bit about that complexity. Well, at the moment, the world is swimming in oil. People are eager to sell. Buyers are fewer than they should be. So right this minute, the Turks aren't worried. The Russians will sell them oil because they have to, because they balance their budget off that. So will Azerbaijan and other countries. But they're looking for the future. They need a steady supply of oil, hydrocarbons. And they think they found that in the eastern Mediterranean and deep sea drilling, where they're competing with the Israelis and the Greeks. And they believe they found it in Libya, where the Russians are supporting Mankos Haftar, who is trying to overthrow the legitimate government, if you want to call that, of Libya. So they are going around. One of the things they're thinking of is a long run about oil. But one of the other things they're thinking about is using the dependency of the seller on oil as a means of controlling them. So where we're used to 30 years ago, really be concerned about the buyer being dependent. Now, 
we're in a different situation where the seller is dependent, and that makes it a lot easier for them to get to the long-term power. They can control these areas and not really care what the Russians think. And do the Russians have any concern about um, losing access to the Bosporus? Well, the Russians are concerned about everything. The Russia is a third world power. It has not developed a modern economy. It depends on the export of a single industrial commodity, oil, and doesn't control its price or have any control over it to the extent that it is the victim of the fluctuation of oil prices. So it's worried about Bosporus. But the problem is the Bosporus, if you ever take a look at a map or ever visit it, it can be closed so easily that it's not a joke. And therefore, any access that Russia has to the Mediterranean really depends not just on Turkey, but on the United States or anybody else who'd want to close it. So the Russians have many, many concerns. They are great bluffers. They are great at pretending that they've got everything under control and you know, they're a great power. But they're a country that's worried about a great deal of things. You know, it's fascinating to watch the oil markets these days. As you say, the world is swimming in oil. We didn't have much of a response when we were uh, getting feisty, we could say, with the Iranians. And, you know, here in recent weeks, we have the Libyan oil production decline. It's now down 75 percent from 1.2 million barrels a day to just over 200,000 barrels a day. The oil markets are giving preferential attention to the coronavirus and, and potential demand destruction. But in real time, we have actual supply destruction, yet no impact on the price. Again, these weird dynamics, given the fact that we're swimming in oil. Talk to me about the long game that Turkey plays, because we tend to think of China as um, a people group that plays a long game geopolitically, geostrategically. But to be organizing supplies that they don't need now for whether it's years or decades ahead – just tell us a bit about the Turkish approach to, to the chessboard. Well, it's like the American. We played out the game for 200 years, heading to our global uh, preeminence. So all serious geopolitical players play long game, because it is a long game. But what they see around them is weakness. They see Russian weakness. They see European weakness. They see not American weakness, but relative indifference. And what they're looking at is a vacuum. Whereas this used to be the most contentious and crowded area in the world, you now see a situation where Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates are allied against other Arab countries. So they look at this and they say, okay, first off, we can't afford the chaos in the Arab world. We can't afford the chaos in the Balkans. This is our neighborhood and we can't afford it. Nobody else is going to put it down. And the second thing they look at is if we can organize this region, as the Ottomans and the Byzantines did, uh, we can come out in a controlling position. So right now, this is a region that was heavily dependent on oil sales and had the control of much of the world's dynamics because of oil. Now all these countries, Saudi Arabia, are weak hands. They don't control Part of this was the United States. The United States surprised everybody, including itself, by becoming a major oil producer and a, not an importer at all. And so areas that used to be filled with powers jockeying for position, like the Persian Gulf, well, it would be a pity if they closed it and it certainly cut off oil, maybe 20 percent of the world supply, if it happened. But the world will go on increasing uh, oil production elsewhere. So what Turkey sees around it are weak hands. And it knows that it can play the game now more than ever. And it's been waiting. I've been, you know, when I wrote my book about this, uh, that was 10 years ago. And Turkey held its own, dealt with the coup d'etat and so on. And now it's picked the moment. It also is one of the only countries with a very diversified economy in the Middle East. So major modern economy of scale, diversified. That puts it in stark contrast to anyone else in the Middle East who might have either religious or political, to categorize it as that, ambitions, um, they actually have something to work off of. Perhaps you could describe it as a greater resilience. And that includes Europe. The Balkans are equally weak. They see the EU as fragmented and weak. So it's not just the region, the Middle East region, the Islamic world that they look at. Oh, that that's clearly weak. They see the Eastern Hemisphere, in a way, as going through a period of weakness, beginning in 2008. And so their view is, if there's going to be order 
around them, and they need order around them. They don't want a southern border to be filled with violence. They're going to have to move into Syria and other countries and take control of the situation. So let's、um, shift a little bit, because as, as important as Turkey is, they're not in the headlines.、Um, so it seems that Americans don't, and perhaps the rest of the world doesn't know how to keep the bigger issues in mind.、Um, but Iran is in everyone's mind. We took out Qasem Soleimani just a few weeks ago. Talk to us about the Shiite Crescent and Iran's work in Lebanon, Yemen, Iraq, with reference to Soleimani and the Quds Force. Well, the story really begins. In the 1980s, when Iraq and Iran fought a war, and over a million casualties in Iran were caused, it was a terrible war. The Iranians are absolutely committed not to ever allowing an attack on Iran from Iraq to take place. This is their number one goal, and therefore, when the United States began to withdraw from Iraq, as in fact the Iranians expected, they moved to fill in the blank space. In fact, in fighting ISIS, U.S. and Iranian Forces collaborated in the Iranian Gulf. As they moved into that area, obviously Syria was the next area they were interested in, and collaborated with the Russians to、uh, save the Assad regime. And finally,、uh, they have Hezbollah in Lebanon. So they've done an extraordinary thing in recent years. They've created this sphere of influence that stretches from Iran to the Mediterranean. And that, that's a long way. The U.S., however, surprised them. The traditional U.S. response. To any problem has been to send in troops. Well, for 18 years we sent in the troops into the Middle East and didn't work. So, starting with Barack Obama and following the same policy with Donald Trump, the United States has shifted away from using forces, and we did something else. We imposed sanctions, heavy sanctions, on the Iranians, and we're able to do that because we're the largest importer in the world. And if we don't import their goods, or we Stop other countries from exporting to the United States if they work with the Iranians. Well, that causes them huge problems. And what has happened is they have a broad empire, if you will, but at the center a very weak one.、Uh, there's tremendous unrest inside of Iran, and it was interesting that when they shot down the Ukrainian airliner, mobs were demonstrating against the Iranian government. So what we have here is a very temporary situation. Of the Iranian Empire, with the American economic sanctions really creating havoc, we now place more on them. And this is one of the important things to really recognize. It's new. We always use sanctions one way or the other, but now our primary weapon is not military, where we haven't done very well. It is economic. We impose sanctions on China, tariffs on Russia.、Uh, we impose them on North Korea. We impose them on、uh, Iran. And it's an incredibly effective weapon. So the last time we interfered in regime change in Iran, we moved out Reza Pahlavi, helped usher in Khomeini. What is your opinion of regime change in this environment? Sanctions seem to be causing some street-level unrest, stress and strain, and so far it's it's not reached sort of the Arab Spring type tipping point. What are your thoughts on U.S. foreign policy as it relates to regime change in Iran? Well, the Arab Spring was replacing one radical Muslim regime with even more radical Muslim regimes. So it was an interesting thing. Inside of Iran, you have a strong secular group, and they're religious, but they are not driven by it. That, these are the businessmen. We call the bazaar. The bazaar is the place where small businessmen have their shops and where people shop. When they rose up, that's what brought the Shah down. Because when they rose up, the army split. And the Shah could no longer survive. So we see a lot of student demonstrations, and student demonstrations don't achieve much. They don't stick with it because they graduate or something. But we are all watching the bazaar, and we have seen at a certain point the bazaar rise, and that was when inflation got completely out of hand because of sanctions, and the government had to produce several maneuvers to bring the price down. So right now the regime is in danger. President Rouhani is balancing between Khamenei and the bazaar, and if it has to come down to picking one, he'll pick the bazaar. So keep your eye on the bazaar, and the bazaar is driven by one thing. Yes, Friday is time for、uh, going to services, and the rest of the week is making money, and they're not making money, and that's the danger.
Well, before we transition to Europe and, and Russia, any comments on our relations with Saudi Arabia or Israel, um, the role they're playing in the region? Well, Israel is now more secure than it's been ever in its history. In fact, ever since it made its treaty with Egypt, which many Israelis opposed, it lost the threat of a multi-front war. Jordan is essentially a protectorate. Syria, well, they control the Golan Heights and they have their own problems. Lebanon, Hezbollah is fighting Syria and they're in no position to do anything. The Israelis are in a pretty strong position. The Saudis are far less important than they were 10 years ago. One of the reasons we have a 32-year-old prince running the place is the panic that the Saudi regime felt. As the price of oil declined and as their control of markets declined and as OPEC declined, Saudi Arabia became just another nation. And it's held together with money. I mean, there are many tribes there, and the way they keep the royal family and these other tribes happy is by paying them. And they're short of cash because you know, their oil capabilities are limited. And this is why the Iranians attack one of their oil systems, just to let them know that if they play too hard against them, they're going to pay a price. So when you look at the region, Israel is doing fine. The Saudis are a shadow of what they used to be. They used to be the center that got American attention, and now, you know, not so much. One of the countries that's emerged that's interesting is the United Arab Emirates. Uh, when I go there to Dubai, I feel like I'm in Singapore. And it works like Singapore. It's become a financial center, a center of technical innovation. They have a minister of space that I met. Uh, you don't imagine the Emirates having a um, space program. But they do, and they, they plan to go to Mars to see Demis and Phobos, the moons there. So a very different Middle East is emerging, even different from the one Al-Qaeda tried to create. They failed. They failed to overthrow any government at all and create the foundation of the, uh, of the uh, caliphate. And so the strong hands are the ones who didn't play that game, the Emirates. And the weak hands, the Saudis, you know, they did play the game, and they played it badly, and they forgot that their real business was oil. So to Europe and Russia, but first I want to brag on you a little bit, because you were discussing the power vacuum in the Middle East and sort of the ambitions of the caliphate long before anyone else I know. And you also were describing what would happen in the Ukraine long before it did happen, uh, looking at the geographical and topographical sort of buffer, which Ukraine and Crimea played for the Russians. So if you would start by describing Putin's recent constitutional changes and uh, maybe comment on his somewhat bizarre references to Polish culpability for World War II in sort of Russia being a victim of aggression. Well, begin with this fact. Russia is just about with return to the borders they had in the 17th century. Russia survives by the buffer zone that the Baltics, Belarus, and Ukraine provided. That's where they defeated Hitler. That's where they defeated Napoleon. And that's gone. The Baltics are in NATO. Ukraine is a giant buffer zone that the Russians don't enter, the Americans don't enter. It's just a buffer between us. And so the Russians are looking at Belarus as the key country. Belarus is a country between the Baltics and the Ukraine. And it's a key country. It's the crucial one, which is that if the West controls Belarus, then Moscow is 400 miles on flat road away, and Smolensk, a major Russian city, is now a border town. If and then the Russians take Belarus, they wind up in a position where their forces are right on the Polish border, on a broad front, and that is a threat. The Russians want to integrate Belarus into the former Soviet Union, in fact, into Russia, as like the former Soviet Union. And there's talk to other countries about recreating it. But this is crucial to Belarus. They're not going to get Ukraine back. They're not going to get the Baltics back. Belarus is the name of the game. Now, I think that what he was doing with this before he restructured the civilian, he restructured the military. He restructured, he fired a bunch of senior officers, replacing them with uh, young fire breathers. And I think he stripped down the government here so the decisions could be made very efficiently. Their government, like ours, has trouble making fast decisions. What he's done is not so much made himself more powerful. He was very powerful. 
he simply created a new decision-making structure because I think he anticipates a crisis in Belarus. And the crisis will be with Poland, because Poland cannot afford to have them in there. And there are a lot of U.S. forces in Poland. They're backing them up. The business, the crazy thing that he said that Poland started World War II and stuff like that was not intended to be true. It was intended to lay a framework of Poland as a aggressive power and Russia as its victim, which if things break out in Belarus is exactly how the Russians want Europe and the rest of the world to think about Poland. And so the Europeans really dislike Poland right now and are threatening to throw it out of the EU for its policies. He sees an opportunity here both to get part of his buffer zone back and have an entente with Europe so long as he demonizes the Poles. So it all makes sense, even though it looks crazy. So Putin's audience um, and, and the actions are, are somewhat preparatory. There's, he's in the process of justifying action through Belarus directed towards Poland. Well, first he wants to see if he can get Lukashenko, who is the head of Belarus, to agree to reintegration. And Lukashenko is a smart old guy. He, he's been bouncing like crazy between the West and the East. But Putin has pushed him to the point where he's spending an awful lot of time talking to uh, the Europeans. Also, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State is going to be visiting Belarus this week. So that's not something that Putin wants to hear, because the last time that kind of stuff happened, he lost Ukraine. But the interesting thing is the media is missing, or very busy with the impeachment or non-impeachment, whatever it is, is missing this game that's being played out in the Eurasian heartland, the Belarusian game. But the Secretary of State's on his way. Poland has been in a very interesting, maybe awkward position, both past and present. I mean, you go back to 1939 and, you know, Germany having designs, Russia having designs, the battleship Schleswig-Holstein showing up near Danzig. Um, it's just, it's a fascinating history. And here we are again, Poland being at, at sort of a critical juncture in the development of this European narrative. Well, if you look at a map, there's something called the North European Plain. It runs from Normandy all the way to Moscow. It is flat. It is traversable. This is the path armies take. It is the path that France sits on, that the Benelux countries sit on, that Germany sits on, and right in the middle of them, between Russia and Germany, is Poland. Poland has had, apart from this period now, in the past three centuries, only about 20 years did it run its own life, and then the period since the fall of the Soviet Union. So... Poland is normally being torn apart by its neighbors. But in this particular case, its two neighbors are weak in a number of different ways. One is Russia, one is Germany. And right now, while Germany and Russia kind of have a strange romance going on, Poland is maneuvering to not only be the blocking point between the two countries, but to really take control of this region, to have influence in Belarus, to have influence in the Baltics, and not surprisingly, the Germans via the EU are attacking Poland everywhere they can. This was a major feature in the next hundred years, a forecast for the 21st century, where you're looking at declining influence uh, in Germany and increasing influence in Poland. Um, and I, you know, part of this is bolstered by our support. Uh, we're completing a missile defense system in Poland this year. That's never been popular with the Russians. But, you know, you you like this theory of, of, of empathy as you look at how various players experience things and how they respond. What is the Russian experience of NATO in recent years? Well, their view is that the most important country in their buffer zone is Ukraine. And the United States staged a coup d'etat against a legitimately elected president to replace it with a pro-American government. The Russians would say, yes, we hack your computers, you send NGOs. And yes, the NGOs in Ukraine were heavily supported by human rights groups, uh, National Endowment for Democracy, and so on. So how he views, how Putin views the United States is as an aggressive power, an aggressive power using covert force to put anti-Russian powers in place. His view is that we promised that no former Soviet Republic would be included in NATO and then included the Baltics. 
The American government denies that it promised it. It's a, it's a long story. Either way, he, Putin believes it and has some reason to. He saw the Ukraine fundamentally important to Russia with a chaos in Maidan Square in, in Kiev. And the pro-Russian leader who had been elected fleeing for life. And he says, look, the Americans are trying to crush us by taking away our strategic necessity. It is as if we were staging uprisings in Texas, was something he once said. So he looks at the U.S. as much more aggressive than we would do. And he looks at his counters, internet, things of that sort, as simply counters to what the Americans have done. So in every case, you'll find each country has its own narrative. And each country finds the narrative of the other preposterous. But when you look at his point of view, he's fighting for his life in the buffer zones, and we're doing everything to take that life. We look at him and say, why in the world would you be interfering in American elections? Why are you trying to create chaos? And his answer is, welcome to the world you created. So the, the empathetic, not necessarily agree with him. That's how he looks at it. But well, we could have a lengthy conversation on the Eurozone, Brexit. Uh, and before we transition to China, I want to know if you have any reflections on, you know, broadly speaking, European integration or disintegration. Europe had a very good entity, uh, the European Economic Community. It was a free trade zone, very much like our North American free trade agreement. We don't tell Canada what kind of schools to have, and Canada doesn't tell us about our legal system and all that, okay? They went from that to Maserich to this highly entangled entity where the center is telling various countries, not just about their economy, but about rule of law and things of that sort. Well, the difference between Poland and Portugal is pretty radical, culturally, historically, and everything else. They talk about a European identity, but the one identity of Europe is it doesn't have a single identity. It has a lot of different countries, and many of them with bad members of each other. And having Germany lecture Poland after its occupation is not something the Poles appreciate. Uh, and, and this is the essential problem, which is, what is Europe? Is it a United States of Europe? No. Uh, Sovereignty is in the States. Is it simply free trade zone? No, it's not that. And now the second largest economy in Europe, Britain, has decided to return to its historical roots, keeping distance from Europe. And the Europeans are raging and promising all sorts of disaster for Britain without understanding how much they depend on Britain. This is the second largest economy, it's the huge importer of European goods. If they do what they think is going to happen, they're going to get hit even worse. Plus, Trump has indicated, and I think Congress will pass this, the British can have a free trade agreement with the United States anytime it wants. And never forget that North American free trade zone has a higher GDP than the EU. The EU always thinks of itself as the great economic bloc. Mexico, the United States, and Canada together are somewhat bigger economically. So trying to, of course, with China, the coronavirus is on everyone's mind at present, uh, not to minimize that, but let's look at context first, where we've got Xi Jinping, who's given himself plenty of political runway, not unlike Putin, uh, sort of leaders for life, restructuring so that they can make strong political moves, organize and control the military more constructively. What's the grand narrative in China? Is this resurgent superpower, challenger to U.S. global hegemony? Does it end up being like Japan in the 1980s? Japan in the 1980s would have been exactly what I would have picked. Look, China has grown tremendously. The idea that you can sustain that level of gut growth for all eternity is nonsense, of course. The Chinese banking system is in complete chaos. One week they want to build reserves, the next week they are telling the banks to cut reserves. They don't know how to handle the situation. The situation is very simple. China, like many post-war economies, built itself on exports. Its entire economy was built on that. In 2008, consumption of exports by the United States and Europe declined fairly dramatically. So China had to face the fact that every businessman has. You depend on your customers. Your customers weren't there. And nobody was in a position in China to buy all the goods they were producing. So China went into a profound tailspin and has not been able to solve the problem. The U.S., using the Obama-Trump model, isn't really worried about military matters. They slammed tariffs on. So it is now 
in a confrontation with its largest customer. That's not the worst you can do. In addition, Xinjiang, which is a Muslim area, which was somewhat in rebellion, basically had a reign of terror placed on it. Hong Kong is rising up because China threatened to extradite people from Hong Kong. This is a deeply troubled country. The coronavirus is interesting. I really can't get my hands around how serious it is as a disease and so on. But I do know this much. The Chinese are absolutely panicking, and Xi is panicking. Xi has to have a tremendous amount of opposition in the Central Committee. He was appointed to be a dictator. You don't appoint a dictator when you're doing well. You appoint him when you're worried. Well, he's not managed the economy in any way that solves the problem. They say they grew 6.1% GDP. But they announced the GDP figures two weeks after the end of the year. So they have no idea. They're making it up. They're down a lot. And it's very much like the problem Japan had. Japan was once a great exporter. It depended on it. One of the things you saw in Japan was its GDP was rising. Its exports were increasing in number, but its banking system was collapsing at the same time. Well, you can get in this situation because your creditors are more important than your shareholders in these countries. And your creditors want cash flow and not rate of return on capital. They want to be repaid. And so you are surging exports, even at a very low profit margin, if any, to keep paying them back. Eventually you can't, and Japan cracked. Well, China is like Japan with an added problem. It has a billion people who live in abject poverty in the interior. So unlike Japan, which was fairly a unified country, relative equality, China is desperately trying to maintain the stability. So it did beautifully. It did an amazing job since Mao died. Uh, and I was lucky for them that it did. And now they are in a pause. The problem is they're finding it very hard to find a stable place to fall. So the idea that they are going to overtake the United States, which was a myth a few years ago, which we just kind of missed, this is not going to happen. Well, this goes back to a comment you made about the world still being in the grips of 2008 and there being a premium on importers. This is something we learned in the 1930s when we went into a global depression in the 1930s, uh, we, we were running trade surpluses, and it's the surplus trade surplus countries that are far more vulnerable. So here we find Germany under significant pressure. We find China under significant pressure. Part of this gets me curious and runs my imagination to when you are in an economic period of pressure. As you said, dictators are appointed in crisis, not in the context of great success. How should we interpret the development and the parasols, the Spratleys throughout the South China Sea? And is that too distant an issue from what we see in Hong Kong and, and, and even Taiwan? Um, your thoughts? First of all, you have to understand that South China Sea is deeply linked to trade. If you take a look at a map, it's surrounded by very small islands. And those islands are very easy to blockade. I mean, the choke points are there. China is terrified that the United States will choose to blockade the South and the East China Sea. And China exists by its trade with the rest of the world. So it badly wants to push the United States back. And it's wanted that for 10 years. And in those 10 years, it has achieved nothing. In those 10 years, its naval forces and rocket forces simply have not intimidated the Americans even slightly. Quite a bit stronger than that. So this is another failure point for the Chinese and for Xi. Uh, their view is, look, this is the South China Sea. We don't want you in a position to blockade us because we believe that you're quite capable of that. And you're like the Caribbean, and you didn't want the Russians in Cuba. And we say, yeah, that's true, but we're not going anywhere anyway. So, you know, we talk about the tremendous strength of the Chinese military, and nobody talks about it more extensively than the American military when it's budget time. But we talk about it, and the fact of the matter is that in 10 years, the Chinese have not been able to change the balance of power even slightly in the South China Sea. But it is linked to trade. It is what terrifies the Chinese. And they can't move us. So as we wrap up, I just can't speak highly enough of the next 100 years. Um, I mentioned earlier geopoliticalfutures.com. And for anyone who's wanting to look at your current work on a daily basis, uh, that's a, just a great resource. 
But for perspective, again, coming back to this idea of context being critical to understanding and depth of understanding being critical to improve planning and strategic choices that we make on a daily basis, your book, The Next 100 Years, is very helpful in doing that, giving some context. And I also liked The Next Decade, kind of shrinking that down a little bit. If you're writing a new version of the next decade, since you wrote that about a decade ago, what would the top three developments be that you would encourage us to stay mindful of? Number one, by far, a German economic meltdown. Germany exports 50% of its GDP. This is the fourth largest economy in the world. It is utterly dependent on its customers' willingness and ability to buy. Its number one customer is the United States, primarily machinery and automobiles. Oh, this is the linchpin of Europe, and its banking system is a shambles. Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank are key banks, and they are a shadow of themselves. So we've seen the Japanese process in place. First, your financial system begins to shatter, and then the rest of it comes down. And that's, that's where Germany is. So that's the first thing that we'd spend an awful lot of time working The second thing is that, and I've just written a book called The Storm Before the Calm that'll be out next week, and that's the United States. I mean, the United States goes through periodic crises, 60s, fresh or whatever. It happens normal for us. We are not yet in it yet. Trump is kind of the forerunner, the Trump administration and the chaos about it. But the next 10 years are going to be very difficult for the United States internally and therefore externally as well. So we really have to watch over the next 10 years. We'll get better. We always come through these, you know, the instability of the United States. And finally, I mean, you have to keep watching the scared countries, China and Russia, and watch how they behave. Because being weak doesn't mean you can't hit hard. And particularly Russia is being backed against the wall, China as well. So the two things I'd look at that, Germany really is the one that scares me. The United States bothers me because we're going into this crisis period. And then you have to look at the former great powers who will try to it one more time. Well, as always, we enjoy our conversation with you and the insights that you bring. And um, geopoliticalfutures.com is, is an excellent resource. I haven't read your your most recent book, The Storm Before the Calm, but I look forward to seeing it. And uh, perhaps we can dialogue on that before too much time passes. Can that be pre-ordered? Yes, on uh, Amazon or something. Amazon? It's uh, due out February 25th. Excellent. Congratulations. We'll um, we'll take a look at that. Uh, The Storm Before the Calm. And for those of you who haven't read The Next 100 Years, must reading. George, thanks so much for joining us on the commentary once again. Great to have you as a guest. Total pleasure. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck, along with David McIlvaney and our guest today, Dr. George Friedman. You can find us at McIlvaney.com. That's M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. And you can call us at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.